okay friends and uh, with this i welcome you to the session on project stakeholder engagement the key concepts see friends uh, the project stakeholder engagement in my experience it is proving to be a very important concept the capabilities that we show on executing the project planning the project or planning execution monitoring and and you know all the aspects of the project management or the, the way the people on the ground the developers the qa the, the stakeholders see everybody working towards the goal is on one end but engaging with the stakeholders managing the stakeholders and stakeholder management i am personally believing nowadays that you know it can influence to a 60% if you can manage the stakeholders well you can actually influence the project success by 60% what we do to to plan to execute to manage and all those aspects is one thing and stakeholder engagement is actually coming out to be a one interesting and core theme area nowadays you know you know identification of stakeholders you know learning how to engage with them derive on a plan how to engage with them and then execute the plan to uh, you know engage with stakeholders manage their expectations monitor their engagement levels this is proving to be a very vital field or very vital subject in today's world so that is why my friends we are going to unfold the project stakeholder management and their key concepts in a structural way okay so let me share my screen okay so the first question is first of all I, we wanted to unfold what are stakeholders who are stakeholders okay let us take a project called road construction okay if we wanted to take up a project called road construction there are positively impacted people there are negatively impacted people for example uh, if you see on the right hand side the commuters they are actually going through either a narrow road or a congested road or a road not very comfortable to go with so the commuters after um, completing the project of new road construction they will get a wider road and hence they are very happy so they are positively impacted their uh, you know their mileage of their vehicles will be more their time to reach their destination will be less the traffic jams will be less the road conditions will be good these are positively impacted people with this project whereas the negatively impacted people are the farmers right they have to give their extra land and who knows whether they will get a market price or not so they are negatively impacted with this particular project so stakeholders are the people who are either positively impacted in this case the commuters okay or negatively impacted in this case the farmers right so stake every project stakeholders who are impacted by or they can impact for example in the project that i have taken here as an example the stakeholders the commuters are positively impacted they are impacted by but in some cases certain stakeholders can impact project progress either in positive way or negative way right friends so after construction of the road it looks like this so the commuters they are positively impacted very comfortably their travel distance will be less the road conditions will be very smooth and the the mileage will be very good for the for their vehicles and they can reach their destination at sooner time but the farmers they are impacted they may not be given the competing market price by the government okay so they are negatively impacted right so what is the definition of stakeholders my friends every project has stakeholders who are impacted by or they can impact the project in a positive or negative way right so so this is what is the definition of stakeholders 
Okay, now I wanted to talk about my ground experiences. Friends, first time I realized the impact of the stakeholders, uh, you know, in around 2005 time frame. Okay, I was managing a project as a project manager. I have a scheduled team with me and we are fulfilling the customer uh, needs and expectations. So suddenly what has happened is because I was working in a large scale organization, you now their quality department has scheduled a project audit. Okay, uh, so I was not uh, knowing the impact of the audit. So somebody said, I want to come and audit. I said, okay, but what, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, management, they have chosen my project because they thought that my project would be the best project where details could be there. But then they came and they have audited and they identified many non-conformances. So the moment, like, you know, from the, with respect to quality assurance, with respect to quality control, with respect to stakeholder management, with respect to scheduling, they identified many, many non-conformances. So I thought, why I should be giving more concern towards those non-conformances, right? So, but then they said, look, we are an audit team and you are executing this project under the umbrella of this entire organization context. You are representing this organization. So you are supposed to, your project is supposed to adhere to certain standards, certain practices, and your project is not obeying to those things. I was thinking, guys, what are you saying? You know, it's about customer. Go and meet the needs of the customer. They said, no, the compliance is important. And suddenly, you know, many people came into the context. Right, me, my team, and my customer, and around us, many people. You know, there are certain people who are saying, "Okay, what is the status of non-conformance? You can why? Uh, you know, what are you doing to to close these non-conformances?" So I was kind of, you know, guys, do you want me to execute the project, or do you want me to take care of your needs? And then I was also asking them, guys, if you are so much interested in my project, why did you not get in my project? all these days and they said you did not realize our presence we you are operating this project under the context of organizational brand and when you execute a project under the organizational brand you are supposed to concur or adhere to certain standards so so you are supposed to do that then i realized oh i should have invited you uh, or I should have realized your presence first itself so that I know your expectations and based on those expectations, I can actually uh, uh, operate this project. Now it's too late. Now I'm to the project. I'm actually fulfilling the customer needs. My team is fulfilling the customer needs. But then the practices that you're talking about, the quality assurance, the quality control, the resource management, the tools, the backup plan, the disaster recovery, those aspects are also important, okay, then I have to do an extra work. So this is where I thought the heat of the stakeholders at, at in my experience. Okay, friends, the second experience is the tail of a red project. See, friends, I'm telling you, when my project turns red, that means when customer is not happy, okay, or we are not meeting the metrics, we are not meeting the service level agreements, suddenly I see a lot of people coming on to my context. Okay, there are people, okay, I'm an architect. How can I help you? Oh, you're an architect. Why did you not, you know, uh, respond to my request so far? So he says, look, my manager is asking me to help you. So I'm coming and helping you now. I was having a different priority at that point in time. Oh, so you're an architect. Okay, now who are you? He says, you know, I'm a lead and I'm, I'm having experience on SharePoint and you have a problem with respect to SharePoint or you have a problem with your front end. I can help you to unblock those things. Oh, and then there is some other people who are coming from back end. There are some people who are coming from QA. There are certain people who are coming directly from central, uh, you know, for task force of the my organization helping. Then I said, okay, now I have to involve these people. Now I thought, okay, so far I'm thinking 
that you know the stakeholders are only my customer myself and my team members and whoever is participating in reviews i realized i did not realize that you know all of you can help me so if i would have realized that you all can help me then i would have invited you i would have involved you i would have leveraged your strengths right from beginning right friends so this is what is then i realized okay when the project is turning red these people are coming now why not i use them right from the beginning and the problem is i did not recognize these people as stakeholders at the beginning had i recognized these things as my stakeholders i would have invited them i would have involved them right from the beginning so that means i would have utilized their strengths right from the beginning so that i could have prevented the project turning to red right friends so so the why of why is the stakeholder management is important friends i'm telling you stakeholders are stakeholders if you don't handle them well i repeat my friends stakeholders are stakeholders they don't let you sleep they don't let you focus on the area that you want to focus upon everybody will be asking when do you deliver so and so what is the eta um, how can i expect it i so and so deliverable got delayed so this is how they 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 make us sleepless right so stakeholders are stakeholders if not handled well but if you engage them early in the game you can actually utilize their strengths right from the beginning right so that's why they become your shareholders right if if a leader right if they correctly identify the stakeholders well before well before and take steps to properly manage them then my friends around 60% opportunity 60% scenarios the project turns uh, you know towards green and customers are happy my friends today it is not just the project deliverables it is about the the customer satisfaction that matters a lot so project deliverables is important customer satisfaction is also important to achieve customer satisfaction you need to know what they need what their expectations how can they can help us what they need from us how they are positively impacted how they can impact me how they are negatively impacted what is the root cause for that we need to know the human science behind it my friends okay so so that's why let us unfold the concept of project stakeholder management in a structural way the first step here is early identification of stakeholders right it is the key and it has to be done periodically my friends in my experience i have understood for example here if you see this is me right and my team i understood usually the stakeholders comes under three orbits the first orbit where i interact with them very regularly probably every week basis every day basis or every biweekly basis so these are the people who participate in the meetings who show interest in my project progress and these are the people with whom i intersect or interact then the second level of orbit of people who probably are actually triggering these first orbit people to to come and participate so these people will be visible to me either uh, uh, in my brainstorming sessions or if i go and uh, you know talk to my sponsors talk to my uh, you know customers right so so who are all the people who are interested in this project because these people are probably the steering committee uh, meeting people okay so they are the little bit higher level and the third orbit usually are the the the, the legal binding authorities or the ceos or the cxos so usually my friends whenever we are operating projects there will be usually a three levels of orbits around us the first orbit is very visible to us for example the blue blue uh, figures if you see here these are all the people who are on your organization side and the uh, in the red dark red figures are on the consumer side they can be customers they can be your partners they can be your business partners right usually in the first orbit for each designation on your side there will be a parallel designation here like a designation architect here have in another technical architect a lead will have a lead a, a scrum master will have a scrum master a program manager will have a project man program manager like this and then second orbit usually they they take care of the needs of one influential person on their side okay the probably these may be a chief technology officer 
okay and here to satisfy the chief technology officer you may be having your engineering head your you know your delivery head and you have your architect working for for the interest of the project and then third level is probably your ceos who basically are legally binded and they work with each other so friends early identification meaning it is just not on day to day meetings you have to uh, uh, engage in brainstorming sessions with your customer you have to analyze the conversations you have to uh, go through the documentation you have to go through the emails so so that you can identify the stakeholders now once you identify the stakeholders you need to understand what are their interests how they can contribute in what phase of the project they are interested in and what is their power power means how can they uh, uh, how can they influence the decision how can they uh, force uh, the decision to go in one way and then what are the right rights that means there can be legal right or moral right, right right and then what are their ownership levels what are their subject matter expertise or specialist knowledge levels how can they contribute and what are their political influences that means how they can influence a decision based upon their uh, different capabilities right and then also what are the prioritization of the stakeholders not every stakeholder is a, an important stakeholder my friends so you have to have a prioritization like you no know, these are my tier 1 stakeholders these are my tier 2 stakeholders these are my tier 3 stakeholders these tier 1 stakeholders uh, their priorities are very important that's very important right so that is one thing so in my opinion i usually identify within three orbits orbit number 1 with whom every week every day we intersect we communicate converse orbit number 2 probably on once in a two weeks basis or a monthly basis orbit number 3 once in three months basis we actually interact with and we have to be cognizant of various documents emails and responses so that we know who are all talking what are their interests at what phase of the project taken their interest lies what are their needs what are their expectations okay friends now we have to classify the stakeholders right the stakeholders classification can be uh, uh, upward that means your cxos sponsors members of steering committee downward that means your team members right your architects and your your own team and then sidewards that means the peers the project managers the program managers the architects who basically uh, 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 compete with your project in terms of sharing the resources and sharing the information and outward that means the people who can influence or who are outward your project who are interested in your project there are their suppliers the government department the public the end users the regulators so so those are the things so you have to classify the stakeholders are they on the upward are they on the downward are they sideways or are they outward right so you need to classify them and then my friends you have to finally prepare stakeholder register see friends i'm telling you it may look like i'm talking theory no my friends i'm not talking i'm telling you one thing if we don't identify stakeholders as a signs they will become your stakeholders and late identification of stakeholders will penalize your team you you will come to know do you want me to work for your requirements or project requirements then you will be in a stalemate you will be in a traffic jam so to avoid you in a traffic jam it is important that we need to unfold the stakeholder registers and periodically update it what the stakeholder register consists of it consists of identification information that means what is my name what is stakeholder's name what is their position location contact day details role how they want to be contacted see friends i'm telling you many a times we will be talking to people we will be taking their inputs and probably we may not be knowing their organizational position is it not for example we may not be knowing the location see in my in my experience i talk to many people i don't know whether they are from uk or they are from netherlands or they are from us so us probably i know but at least 
in what part of Europe they belong, I do not know. Then setting up the meetings will be difficult, right? So, so it is important to know the name, the organizational position, the location, the contact details, and the role that they play on the project, their expectations. The second thing is your assessment. That is, what are their major requirements? What are their expectations? What are their potential on, for influencing project outcomes? And what phase of the project they are mostly uh, you know, interested in, right? So this is what is important. And then classification, are they internal stakeholder or the external stakeholder? What kind of impact, influence, power, interest they can exert on the project outcomes, right? And then are they upward to you, downward, outward, and sideward? So this kind of classification is very important. So, so stakeholder register consists of all these attributes. A few of the attributes I've shown in the table here, but this is very, very important. My friends, on the field, we do not maintain stakeholder register to the large extent. In 90% of the project, I listen, I see, I talk, I sense that we do not maintain stakeholder register at all. Why? Because we are in speed to deliver the project deliverables. But then what happens? The stakeholders will become stakeholders. And then we'll have to pay the penalties, my friend. To avoid it, we need to make sure that, you know, we have to unfold the science of stakeholder management in a structural way. The first thing is the identification of stakeholders. The outcome of identification of stakeholders is stakeholder register. So the stakeholder register consists of all these attributes and it is the first step. And this stakeholder register should be updated periodically, not just at the beginning of the project, but to be done every bi-weekly basis, every monthly basis. Why? Because some stakeholders may get added, some stakeholders may get deleted, and some stakeholders may be replaced, and some stakeholders' prioritization may get changed. So, so that is the reason why we need to maintain stakeholder register updated periodically. So having said it, the next step that we are proceeding is how can I plan stakeholder engagement? My friends, the beauty lies here. The beauty lies is you are planning the engagement. What is engagement? See, at the end of the day, the, the, the leader's role, the manager's role is to make sure that all stakeholders' needs and expectations are fulfilled. Point number one. Point number two is they, their contributions, their subject matter expertise are utilized towards the success of the project. To, to achieve these things, they need to engage, involve in the project journey. Do you think these things are happening? No, my friends. Not many people are in today's world even though they are stakeholders, they will come at the end of the journey. It is our responsibility to spot them, to learn their needs and expectations, to know their strengths and get them involved in the project as early as possible. So that is why the science of planning stakeholder engagement is all about spotting their needs, spotting their expectations, understanding at what phase of the project they'll be involved and identify strategies to get them, okay? Now, how can we plan? Do you have any tools at hand? Yes, my friends. The first thing is expert judgment. Friends, experts are, the, the, they, they give you information uh, very quickly, right? So, so you can go and talk, okay, these, these people are important people, you know them. So can you please tell me, based upon your previous association with them, uh, what are their needs and expectations of these people? At what phase of the project they're interested in? And what kind of prioritization number I should give? Shall I put them under tier one, tier two, or tier three? What are their key strengths? What kind of opportunities I can generate using their strengths? And how they can apply uh, their influence levels? 
okay so in a power grid in a power structure where they stand how can they they in, they can force a decision within an organization that's what is power politics is all about influencing the decision how can they influence the decision see friends we have seen some people who talk formally within the formal meetings but there are certain stakeholders who actually runs many things behind right they tend to have one on one discussion they tend to explain the context of the project they tend to make people agree on certain decisions so this is called politics politics is not bad politics is your ability to influence decision for a better tomorrow that is important my friend you have to use politics not for personal interest you have to use politics for a better tomorrow of the project for a noble goals of the project so how they can play politics and power and then what is the environment we are working upon what is the culture what kind of insights we are getting and what is the communication means how they want to be approached how can i approach them nowadays even social media is also playing a play a role there right along with the the microsoft teams or zoom you also see people talking uh, uh, using whatsapp uh, while the meetings are going on right and what are their traits see there are certain people who are result oriented so for them what matters is okay this is the current state this is the to be state and what kind of rational logic people are talking and how can how can i get them to that situation that's all the people are just goal oriented you have to have it approach differently right there are certain other people who are people oriented right for them the the the, the mindset of the people the the uh, the work life balance and uh, those things matters a lot there are certain people who are extremely task oriented so you have to have different strategies to deal with different stakeholders so the whole planning the stakeholder engagement is about understanding the needs and expectation understanding the prioritization of the stakeholders understanding the power and po politics grid and structure understanding the environment and the cultural insights my friends culture plays a lot see friends i'm telling you being in one location of this earth we think our uh, city is good our locality is good our country is good but it is or our country culture is the best culture so everybody feels the same thing right so when we are doing business we are mutually dependent on each other we should be cognizant of certain tactics traits which other culture uh, does not appreciate so those things we should be mindful while communicating it's very important similarly the environment we are in for example a person can be a, a, a jovial but not in a situation where in a priority one bug uh, bugs are there production problems are there when the environment is so hot that you know everybody is concerned about the health of the system then you can you can't just be jovial there you need to you need to be uh, uh, cognizant of the environment and moods of the situation right so this, the second thing is friends uh, to understand the engagement levels right uh, this part of power grid makes a lot of sense okay on the x axis you put interest on the y axis you put power or ability uh, or their ability to influence a decision right and if the interest level is high and their power is low just keep them informed to those people if their interest level is high and their uh, their uh, in power is high manage them closely you need to spend a lot of time to to talk to them to understand to them you need to have one on one discussions to know what their critical interests are what their needs are if they are not happy why they are not happy what is the root cause analysis what kind of alternative and options we can generate communicate with them our aspect of challenges make them uh, uh, you know realize our aspect of it our context of it probably you may want to have one on one discussions lunch meetings informal meetings and you also need to see okay these people how i can influence upon through other people in the org so this is how the strategy is you have to manage them closely the third thing is if the interest is low and power is high 
then you have to keep them satisfied. That means they don't participate much, but however, the, but however, their power is high. So you need to know those, their uh, expectations and you need to satisfy that. And when power is low and interest is low, just monitor them, right? So this grid actually provides you an opportunity to align people under different heads. Right. With so so this kind of uh, uh, analysis on the x-axis and the y-axis, it will help you. So it will help you not only position the people, but also it helps you to drive a strategy. What is the strategy? For example, if the interest is high and power is high, and then you have to manage them closely. That means you need to spend a lot of time to understand their strengths, their, their expectations. And you need to know how they wanted to have a better future, right? A uh, better future. They wanted to. So we need to make sure that, you know, these things are there. Okay. Then next is stakeholder engagement assessment matrix. For example, my friends, here in this case, right? Uh, stakeholder engagement. For example, you put stakeholders, stakeholders one, stakeholder two, stakeholder three, stakeholder four, stakeholder five. And you are trying to put them under different things. Unaware, resistant, neutral, and supportive leading. What is unaware? Unaware is they are not aware of project's progress and risk thereon. That means there are certain people, they are not aware. For example, if you take an architect that is there in an organization, he is not aware of all the project's uh, progress and all project risks. So he is he's not aware. So it is our responsibility. See, currently he is unaware. The C means un uh, currently. D means desire. That means this, for example, let's say stakeholder one is an architect playing at the central level. He may not be aware of your project progress. He may not be aware of the risks. But however, you have to get him to leading position. What is leading? That means strongly contributing, right? Leading position or at least supporting position at the analysis phase of the project, right? So it is our responsibility. So he may not be willing to uh, come to leading stage. You have to create the environment. You have to create the situation such that your architect feels that, you know, I need to contribute to this project and you are successful in getting his engagement. So how do I get my stakeholder one? That means architect, right? From unaware to leading state. So unaware means he's not aware. Leading means he's full support of the project. He contributes. Okay. There is another person called, you know, stakeholder too. Let's say he's resistant. That means he's aware of the project, but he's unsupport of the project work. For example, in the example that I have taken earlier, right? This, this project, right? So the farmer here in this case is aware that, you know, the road will help the public, but he is not um, in support of this work. Why? Because his land is at uh, risk. He is not getting the proper uh, value. So you need to, basically he is, uh, if you come out here, the strategy here is he's resistant. That means he's aware of the project benefits and risks, but he's not um, supportive of the project work because he's not satisfied. So you do, to, you, we can get them either to neutral or we can get them to supporting. How can I get it? We can get them by doing a root cause analysis. Why a person is resistant? How can I get him to desired state, right? What kind of strategies I can uh, come with? So this is what is, you know, a uh, stakeholder to who is resistant. Then there are third, certain people, you know, who are neutral. That means they, they, are, ne they are neither uh, supportive nor, uh, uh, nor uh, uh, resistant. So, for example, if there are certain legal bodies, right, or there are certain people who are government uh, regulators. So, for them, they're just not bothered, even though uh, they think that the initiative or the project that you are working upon is going to be useful, right? So, what I'm conveying here is we need to get them to leading or supporting stage. Similarly, there are certain people Currently, they are supportive and they are desired, desired also, uh, you know, in the supportive stage. So that is good. So we don't need to do anything work, just make them, uh, you know, continue. So my friends, what is the information we are getting using this particular grid, right? 
we are actually segregating them into unaware, resistant, neutral, supportive, and leading, right? Unaware means they are unaware of the project's progress and risks. Resistant means they are aware of the project, but they are not supportive of the project's work. For example, the farmers in case of a road construction project. Neutral means government bodies. They are, even though they are aware of the project benefits, they just, uh, you know, carry on with their rules and regulations. They are not bothered. But, you know, if you get them to leading stage, you will get fast approvals. Supportive means, you know, if the customer is in supportive stage currently and des desired also is supportive, that is even more good. Leading means, for example, you know, your leads, your QA lead, test lead, development lead, your organizational architects, they all should be in the leading state that should be supportive of the project work so that, you know, your customers, right? And these people should be in the leading state so that you can, you, all their energies can be contributed towards their success of the project, right? So this is called stakeholder engagement assessment matrix. Now, the other techniques are root cause analysis. That means, uh, you know, whenever you identify a deviation between current, uh, you know, current uh, engagement and desired engagement, right? C means current engagement, D means desired engagement. So you need to understand the root cause analysis. What are the reasons underlying the reasons that why uh, uh, they are not uh, um, at a different stage? How can I make them to the desired engagement level? Right? This is the root cause analysis. And then there are certain assumptions, there are certain constraints. For example, my friends, on the customer side, some people may not help, even though you understand they will uh, cooperate with us. That may be because their power structure does not allow them. Their org structure does not allow them to support you of an idea, even though personally they are willing, but professionally on paper, they will not, uh, they will not support our idea. Right. So this is what is uh, you have to you have to understand these techniques. One is, you know, uh, power versus interest grid. OK. The second one is uh, uh, the stakeholder engagement assessment matrix, current and desire. OK. And people may be in under unaware state, resistant state, neutral state, supportive state and leading state. Unaware means they are not aware. For example, I have told the example of a project architect or your, your uh, director, okay? They are unaware because they are, they focus on many, many projects. So you have to get them to leading a stage at least at the initiation phase or at least during some customer escalation stage. So how can I get them to leading stage, uh, you know, leading stage because we require their energies. So this is what is decides the gap. And the moment you identify the gap between current and desired engagements, you will actually come up with a root cause, a plan, right? So you, so the moment you identify the gap, you also need to understand the root cause analysis. You need to understand the assumptions and constraints so that you properly come up with a proper, proper action. And then you actually come up with a stakeholder engagement plan. That means the stakeholder ones needs and expectations are this. Now there is a difference in their current and enga desired engagements. The root cause is this, and these are the actions I'm taking. And these actions are assigned to so-and-so person. And we are going to review the engagement index from current to the desired in the, at the uh, probably in a month time from now. And this is the ETA. So this is how we need to come up with engagement plan. Friends, please understand the beauty of it. See today, on the ground, you listen, hey, friends, stakeholders are very important. Uh, customers are the reason we are here in the business. All those things people are talking. But how can I get it? That's the point, right? How can I engage properly? That's the point. The moment you know a proper engagement analytical suggested plan, then you can take action. That is the beauty of this session. So what we're telling is if it... You have to plan the engagement. You have the engagement. That means stakeholders' energies need to be, uh, you know, aligned to the success of the project. So, what are the techniques? First, expert judgment. The experts will provide you the the, the cues very easily based on their experience. Second, uh, put the stakeholders or place them under power versus interest grid or influence 
uh, versus interest grid and derive strategies based upon the, 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 the grid that we see in front of us. The third thing is identify their current engagement and their desired engagement. See, the goal should be both current and desired should be under the same head, right? The moment there's a deviation, that means you have to bring them to the desired engagement level. Now, for that, you need to understand the root cause analysis, why there is a deviation, okay? And then how can I influence uh, their engagement from current to desired state, okay? And then what are the assumptions that I am making in this process? What are the constraints I'm making in this process, right? So, and then finally, we need to arrive at stakeholder manage engagement plan, right? So once you have stakeholder engagement plan, then you keep this plan, right? The book that you see, the stakeholder engagement plan, whatever you have planned that you developed here, keeping this, this is you and your team. And then you try to manage all the stakeholders. There are certain green stakeholders who are leading you. There are amber stakeholders who are uh, probably, uh, you know, they support you. There are uh, blue stakeholders who are neutral, black stakeholders, they are resistant. So likewise, there are stake red stakeholders who are unaware, right? So you have to engage them because you have derived an action plan to get them from current to desired uh, engagement index. So you have to engage them. So how do you do that? One is feedback. Friends, I'm telling you, feedback is a powerful instrument. You need to constantly take feedback, formally and informally. And then the moment you take the feedback, you need to process it and figure it out. What are the actions that are low hanging fruits? That means if you act on these, these, these things and these things, it can be closed and they give you more impact. Go to the customer or go to the stakeholder and say, look, you talked about four and one I have already closed. And then show them that we listen to them. Show them that their concern is important to us. Show them that, you know, we, we are committed to get their commitment for the success of the project. Make them feel important and do it continuously. Number one. Second thing is you have to do negotiation. My friends, whatever stakeholder asks, we cannot give. Because at the end of the day, we are working with certain limitations and constraints right? The constraints can be the practical constraints, which we cannot explain to the stakeholders. They are organizationally, internally visible. There are certain constraints, which government, uh, 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 political constraints, you know, environmental constraints, right? Safety constraints can be there. There are certain constraints on the customer side. There are certain constraints which are legally binding. So we have to explain to the person, boss, you position myself. In my, in my, you position yourself in my context and think about it. Okay. I'm able to see why you are expecting this, but this is the thought process to this extent. We can understand that negotiation should happen with the priority one or tire one stakeholders, and then address any risks or potential concerns immediately. Friends, I'm telling you today, the soft skills, the attitude is our altitude. Right. So more than capability. Nowadays, the capability is only coming up to 40 percent. 60 percent is your, you know, your attitude uh, matters a lot. Your attitude is your altitude. So the, the moment you identify potential risks to the overall engagement, right, and overall program, then you have to spot those risks. You have to spot the concerns of the people and then put them into issue log and make sure that you derive an action plan and show to them that we are working sincerely. Believe me, when you show them that we are doing our extreme best and provide them transparency from time to time to stakeholders, they will be with you, friends. This is where I said, if you engage stakeholders effectively, they will become your shareholders. They will always ask you to be there in the team. I have seen engagements wherein they say, I can give you the project only if you keep these, these, these people in the project. So such kind of uh, uh, important you become not because of your capability, but because of your ability to manage stakeholders, your attitude to work for the noble goals. And then after resolving those, their concerns, you have to clarify them that, you know, these, these things got already resolved. Okay. So in the, in the process of managing and monitoring stakeholder engagement, 
I find this tool, this analysis helped me a lot. For example, let's assume that, you know, I am putting, right, <clears throat> alignment or noble connect on the y-axis and I am putting a uh, uh, need on the need with the other person on the x-axis. For example, if the need with the person is more, that is high, and he is not aligned to us, he is not aligned on the noble goals that we are talking. For example, you are working for a project goals. And for example, I'm just trying to put you, you are working with a, with a specific developer who is uh, only concerned about his personal objectives. You try to help them, help him to influence upon project outcomes, but he's not influenced. He always want to work for his personal objectives, but we have a great need to work with him. We need to get them. We need to get his energies into the project. So, so there's a potential problem, potential conflict may come because his priorities are his goals. Our priorities are project goals. So now the some of the technique, this technique is when other person's alignment towards the noble goal that we are working or the noble goal with us, the alignment is not proper. That means low and the need is high. Then just talk on only mutually interested topic. Don't get on to uh, wider topics. The moment you get on to wider topic, he'll pick on it and he will make it a big uh, uh, issue. And then unnecessarily he takes away, he or she takes away your energies. So when the need is high, alignment is low, you have to focus only on mutually interested topic. What is mutually interested topic? The project, the task, the due date, where can I do, what support you need, what issues, that's all. Don't talk more. Then let's assume that there are people whose, uh, you know, need, our need on them is low and their alignment is also low. Ignore. Okay. Don't spend more energies there. See, then in project, there are many people. They want the moment uh, they spot you as a go-to person, they will destroy your energy, right? If the need on them is low and they are not understanding the noble goals that we are working on, just ignore them. The moment I, the, why I'm saying ignoring? The energies that you put to get them onto a noble goal, that will, is a waste of energy. You tried, it's not working and you probably have to replace them shortly. Right? Don't don't get them. Don't, don't honestly spend your effort there. And the third thing is, the need is the need is low, but they are highly aligned. That means they want to contribute, but they don't know. They would know how to do that. Then in that situation, force them like a parent. Like you know, see kids. No kids. They show high alignment. Right? So show show. They say just you have to do this. That's all. Because they understand alignment is anyway there, right? And then finally, the, the, the problem solving grid. That means the need with the person is high and he's also properly aligned. That means alignment is high. Alignment towards noble goal is high. The need uh, with which we have to mutually work is high. Then it's just solving problems. The conf Every conflict is leading to solving the problems in a better, better way. So this tool has helped me in terms of structuring my communication. So I always think about, okay, the next party, what is the need and what is the alignment and to what extent I have to go. See, I try my best to, to, to talk to the person, to help the person to understand, but there's a limit because at the end of the day, we have two hands, we have 20 hands of the work. Who will do my job if I keep engaging with unnecessary discussions, which is not giving any fruitful results. So, so basically put them under these particular, uh, you know, quadrants and try to, uh, you know, derive a strategy to, to solve the uh, conflicts or to, to uh, derive how to engage with the people. Okay. The other tools are interpersonal skills. That means active listening. Friends, when people are, uh, when people are uh, telling their problems, I've seen certain individuals who listen very actively. See, when you, they listen, they listen with pin drop silence. They listen with absolute focus on you. They listen with an empathy. They listen with keeping their, their themselves in your shoes. They, they listen with your lenses, right? They want to see the situation from their lenses. So active listening, my friends, it is becoming the key parameter 
in terms of getting the warmth of the stakeholders, right? The second thing is conflict ma in management. I just now talked. Third thing is cultural awareness. See, you have to be very, very careful, friends, in terms of, you know, what works well, what does not go well with different cultures. When we are becoming global and global, we need to, uh, we need to be sensitive, sensible. I've seen some people who play the cultural awareness on the right side, on the, on the, in, a, in a positive way, right? They, they remember your festivals. They remember certain uh, 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 words of your language. And they, they tell you that, you know, uh, today so-and-so is festival and I wish you a good festival day. And you feel very happy. Are you happy? I was, have been thinking, we have been working on these deliverables. How come he's getting time to, to learn about insights of my native language, my regional language, and he's speaking about it. And I feel good about him. If somebody talks about my uh, 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 regional language, I feel good. And they are investing this uh, time to get our goodwill. Right, it's good. Right, it's good. Connecting each other, wishing each other, and uh, it's good. So that once we are connected, person to person, what happens is, you know, the, the, anything we can communicate very easily. Then third thing is leadership, friends. I'm telling you, the leadership is very, very important. I have seen situations wherein there are certain leaders who 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 puts us on the fighting on the fighting line on the fire line, and they step away. Uh, in those situations, we lose motivation. I have also seen leaders uh, who who stays on their word. I've seen such leaders working under that their leadership is a joy. The right is a joy. So what they have been talking, they'll be doing as well. They'll be with you on a fire line, a difficult situation. If somebody criticizes you. They will tell, look, this person is actually uh, performing the root uh, uh, or solving. He's solving the problem of so-and-so. Probably you don't understand the height with which he's talking. You're only, only looking from your angle. So try to understand him. Is is such kind of leadership they provide. They provide a vision to you, a direction to you, a guidance to you, a number alert to you, and you feel secure. So nowadays, my friends, when people are switching their jobs, it is not just for salary. It is about having a proper and trustable environment and leadership. The next one is networking. Friends, net, your network is net worth. See, friends, again, I'm telling you, network means not exchanging irrelevant information, right? So the time people spend on each other should be mutually benefit. So that's why networking on a relevant and mutually benefit topics is what actually makes the, 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 the uh, engagement more rich. And then again, I said political awareness. Pol politics is not wrong, my friends. Politics, the definition of politics is ability to influence a decision. If this ability to influence a decision is exercised in the favor of project goals, then that's good. So, so politics is good provided it is exercised towards the goals of project and organization. The next one is communication skills. See, friends, I'm telling you, communication nowadays is becoming very, very important topic because we are becoming more and more global, right? We are becoming more and more global. So, so how we converse, how we start our conversation, how do we prepare for those meetings, right? And both formal and informal. It's very important. Conflict management, I already talked about it. Negotiation. Negotiation is about, you know, you can't give everything what others want because you don't have it, right? So, so how, you, how can you negotiate so that a win-win strategy is identified? To achieve win-win strategy, you need to lose something. They need to lose something. How can you get to that situation? How do you negotiate? How do you prepare for negotiation? What are the things so you need to first understand what other people are coming to negotiation table? What are their interests? What they need? And what I can give? To what extent we can settle? Where we need, if a stalemate comes, if a stalemate comes, where to drop off? And also, my friends, as part of negotiation, you should know the art of, you know, uh, postponing the conversations. Okay, we did uh, the conversations for the last one and a half hour. Can we postpone it? to uh, or, or, or can we reschedule this 
to next week so that we'll process on each other's idea and then we can think back. So we need to postpone it. We need to reschedule it. We need to do it at a repetitive, at a different time interval so that people at the back of their mind, they think what they have discussed during this meeting and they come with more revised thought process there. And political awareness, I talk. And my friends, ground rules, especially when we work internal or external people, there should be certain ground rules. And these ground rules in agile context is called working agreements. And these will help to bring a uniformity on certain non-compromisable uh, actions or behaviors. And then finally, my friends, every meeting is a touch point. Every meeting is a touch point. It is not that you go to the meeting you know, and dynamically you talk or ad hocly you talk. When you do such, uh, when you talk just like this in a meeting, you are actually uh, 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 diluting your brand, right? You're diluting your uh, 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 persona there, right? Everybody will start uh, uh, making their perceptions the way everybody perceive in a dynamically in a meeting. So you need to identify what are my important meetings for the next week, okay? And how, how they are important, what kind of preparation I can make, whether how can I secure all the required people for the meeting and what is the what is the preparation that I have to do to meet, reach the meeting, then you can actually uh, provide a best meeting preparation, best meeting outcome. My friends, I'm telling you in one of the international seminars, there was an excellent speaker who spoke for about half an hour and everybody was mesmerized to listen to that person. Now, after that particular, um, uh, you know, the spe speech was over, uh, you know, uh, one of us approached him and said, how could you deliver that great lecture? He said, I have rehearsed at least 30 times. Then we are stunned. 30 times you have rehearsed for this 30 minute speech? Excellent. So friends, I'm telling you, the great people, they rehearse, they prepare, they're, they care about the kind of outcome they could get from the meetings. So such why, that is why, uh, you know, meeting preparedness to derive results also helps us a lot. So friends, what we learned so far, we have to unfold the concept of project stakeholder engagement through identify stakeholders, plan stakeholder engagement, manage stakeholder engagement, monitor stakeholder engagement, right? And if you do it, they will become your shareholders. If you do it structurally, you, they will become your shareholders. Their energies, you can align towards project outcome, whether they are on the business side, customer side, internal side, external side, you can align their strengths, right? And it's just a music, a music brand, you know, a band. When, for example, is singing, a, a song is happening, a performance is happening, one person will sing, one person will do uh, different musical instruments, all will go in one rhythm. And for the, uh, for the sponsors, it is like a good song they're listening under a good beat. So that is where every musical instrument, all the singers, they're going in a rhythmic way. This is how the, the, the best performance can be understood. So share, stakeholders or your shareholders, if you handle them well. Okay, if you do not handle them well, my friends, if you do not handle them well, what happens is they become stakeholders. My friends, I want to explain to you under today's context, at least 60% of the projects are failing, not because of capability, but because of inability to, to manage stakeholders efficiently. So that's why my friends, as part of this topic, we wanted to say, project stakeholders or your shareholders if you handle them well. Thank you for your time and I am open now for questions.